the media was totally consumed with the Novak Djokovic case, where the immigration minister cancelled his visa using his powers under the Migration Act. The minister has almost unlimited intervention powers. Both the government and Djokovic handled it badly, but what interested me was the rhetoric used by the government. Rules are rules. And there are no special cases. Rules are rules. It's what I said to you yesterday. Uh, that's the policy of the government. Uh, the way it works is this. People try to run the border all the time, by the way. You know, people come with a visa but may not satisfy other requirements for entry. Um, and people are put on planes uh, and turned back all the time. Um, anybody who's watched uh, the Border Patrol shows will understand that. This is not an irregular act thing to happen if someone is put on a plane and, and told to return to their country, even if they may have come with a valid visa. But are rules the rules for everyone? Let's take a look at one of the best examples. It seems to me there are four proven steps the Morrison government uses to take care of a scandal. In 2018, it was revealed that on two separate occasions, au pairs with tourist visas had their visas cancelled on arrival into Australia. Peter Dutton, as Immigration Minister, intervened in these cases to grant them visas anyway. At this point, not much else was known. A few days later, the Greens asked a question to Peter Dutton in Parliament. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Minister, I note your recent statements in relation to your personal intervention to prevent the deportation of two foreign intended au pairs. Can you categorically rule out any personal connection or any other relationship between you and the intended employer of either of the au pairs? The Minister for Home Affairs. The answer is yes, Mr Speaker. I haven't uh, received any personal benefit. I don't know these people. They haven't worked for me. They haven't worked for my wife. Uh, I've repeated all of that yesterday and I repeat it again today. The reality, Mr Speaker, is if the honourable member has some allegation to put, go outside into the public domain, put the allegation, and I'll deal with it in the usual way. Has Peter Dutton was asked, can you categorically rule out any personal connection or any other relationship with the intended employers? The clear answer was that there was no personal connections. At the end of his answer, he also said that allegations should be made outside of Parliament for him to deal with it in his normal way. That was a legal threat. Ministers can pretty much say anything in Parliament and be protected from a defamation lawsuit under what's called parliamentary privilege. Given Dutton's history of suing for defamation, I want to make it clear that everything in this video is my opinion, based on public information. Anyway, the problem for Dutton was that more details would emerge over the coming months that would lead to a Senate inquiry. Let's look at both the au pair cases and see if his denial stacks up. In 2015, an Italian woman was questioned by the Australian Border Force when she landed in Brisbane Airport. She had a tourist visa, which doesn't allow you to work while in Australia. The investigators found that her visit wasn't for tourism purposes. For example, she had messages asking whether she was traveling to Australia to study or to work as an au pair, and she had responded as an au pair. Turns out, she had come to Australia to stay with a family, and the father had been a Queensland police officer in the late 90s. But guess who else was a Queensland police officer at the same time? Peter Dutton. Here they are together. Once Border Force decided to cancel the au pair's visa, Peter Dutton's former colleague sent him an email. A few hours later, Peter Dutton used his ministerial intervention powers to grant a fresh tourist visa. His reason for intervening was that it was in the interests of Australia as a humane and generous society to grant this person a tourist visa. The Adelaide case was pretty similar. In 2015, a French woman was questioned by the Australian Border Force when she landed in Adelaide Airport. She also had a tourist visa. The investigators had a number of red flags which prompted them to cancel her visa. Peter Dutton's office asked the Department of Immigration to provide him with an intervention briefing. That briefing noted that there were clear indications that the woman was intending to work in Australia and the granting of the visa was of high risk. It turns out that the family this au pair had come to work for was a relation of AFL CEO Gillan McLaughlin, who had met Peter Dutton a number of times. 
The intended employer's family were also big Liberal Party donors, with a $50,000 donation being made in the months after the intervention. Gillan McLaughlin had his staff get in touch with Peter Dutton's office, and again, within a few hours, a ministerial intervention resulted in a fresh tourist visa being issued. This was despite the Australian Border Force labelling the au pair as high risk of breaching her visa conditions, and noting that warnings to her had already been provided on previous visits to Australia. Commenting on Peter Dutton's intervention submission, the Australian Border Force said that they do not agree with the content or think it appropriate that the minister intervene. The reason Peter Dutton gave for intervening was again in the interests of Australia as a humane and generous society. Now some of the information about the Adelaide case was leaked from within the Australian border force. Keep that in mind because we'll come back to it. I'm not sure how you can stand up in parliament and say that there was no personal connection involved in either of these cases. Denial didn't work. So the next phase kicked in. Once more information started coming out, the government began minimising the personal connections that had been revealed. For example, in the Brisbane case with the Queensland police officer, after being caught out, the talking points started to shift. To the best of my knowledge, I have not socialised, met with or had personal contact with the man involved. Uh, and in fact, I worked, I finished work with the Queensland Police Service in July of 1999. At that time, from my recollection, there were 5,500 police officers within the Queensland Police Service. He does not have my personal phone number or my personal email address. The use of terms such as personal connection or relationship, as used by the member for Melbourne in, this, in his question, signify a much closer relationship between two people than working in the same organisation two decades ago and then not speaking with each other since that time. Now, no reasonable person could come to the conclusion that my professional association, through working in the same on my large public service some 20 years ago, constitutes either a personal connection or relationship. Mr Speaker, I also put on the record the following in regard to the matter. The individual that did not have contact uh, with me in regard to this matter, he wrote an email to my publicly available email account, which can be accessed by anyone online. OK, so let's take a look at that email. Peter. Long time between calls. Not exactly how you or I would address a minister we didn't have a personal connection with. But this saga wouldn't be complete without Scott Morrison jumping in to try and minimise the situation with a quick lie. Here he is saying that the email Peter Dutton received wasn't even in the name of the former colleague. So on top of that, if someone makes an application not even in the name of the person you worked with 20 years ago, I mean... That's, that's what doesn't pass the pub test. The allegation that is being made that somehow there was some relationship or knowledge does not pass the pub test at all. Except here is that letter again, clearly signed off in the name of Peter Dutton's former colleague. The other tactic used to try and minimise the situation was to say that this kind of intervention happened all the time. Have a look at uh, the thousands of cases that an immigration minister deals with uh, on a yearly basis across administrations. Contact is made through members of parliament. Uh, cases are, are presented to my office on the phone, people ringing up uh, my office uh, uh, every day, sending emails in uh, to my MP address, etc. In terms of the assessment, I, I look at matters on their merit. But the stats provided to the Senate inquiry by the Department of Home Affairs tell a different story. During his years as Immigration Minister, Peter Dutton intervened to grant visas 4,129 times. That's a lot, but drilling down into the detail gives you a better picture. Out of all those interventions, only two cases involved non-citizens having their tourist visas cancelled at the airport because of intentions to work. And it's no surprise that those are the two cases we are talking about here. Then there was evidence from a range of migration agents who were all shocked at the involvement and turnaround times for these interventions, a power that is meant to be used for exceptional circumstances. The witnesses noted that it would often take many days to receive an initial response, even in cases where a person was at risk of imminent deportation to a country where they had genuine fears for their safety. So much for a humane and generous society. One witness noted that in her experience, it was often the case of who the applicant knows that decides the outcome, 
rather than the merits of the application. This most likely isn't unique to the Liberal Party. I'm sure if you were to examine decisions from all previous immigration ministers, Liberal or Labor, you'd have some questions. But there is no doubt that more transparency is needed. The power to intervene is important, but the issue is that the minister doesn't have unlimited time and the limited time dealing with these matters should be directed to exceptional circumstances based on merit. And here is where things start getting even more concerning. In October 2018, about a month after the Senate inquiry concluded its report, the Australian Federal Police conducted a number of raids. Remember I said that there had been information about these interventions leaked by someone within the Border Force? Well, that leak was referred to the AFP, who raided both the Department of Home Affairs, where that person worked, as well as their home. Documents and materials were seized. Peter Dutton has constantly denied that he knew about the raids in advance, but documents provided by the AFP under Freedom of Information confirmed that the AFP notified Peter Dutton's office the day before. That warrant activity will now be first thing tomorrow morning, said the AFP. Peter Dutton's office replied with, Thanks mate, this Arvo also fine. And the AFP sent back a thumbs up. The reason this early notification is interesting is that the AFP has said on other occasions that ministers are not consulted of raids beforehand. Was any government minister consulted about the raid on journalists prior to the event? No, they weren't, Lee. That's normal, normal business. We, uh, this is police business and we don't consult with ministers before we do that. Luckily for the whistleblower, when the search warrants were being executed, they made a phone call to Senator Louise Pratt, who was the chair of the Senate inquiry into the EOP matter. Senator Pratt then made a claim of privilege against all the items seized by the AFP. At the beginning of the video, I talked about parliamentary privilege and the protection it gives to politicians to say basically anything they want in parliament, without fear of being sued for defamation. Parliamentary privilege provides other protections as well. Basically, because the whistleblower was providing information to the Senate inquiry and corresponding with the senator, privilege also came into play to protect the Senate from interference by the AFP. Following the raids, the Senate looked into the conduct of the AFP. They upheld the privilege claim, meaning the documents couldn't be used by the AFP for their investigation. And as a result, the investigation concluded. The Senate also considered that proper protocol had not been followed in the execution of the search warrants and seizing of materials. Peter Dutton also tried to intimidate Labour who were asking a lot of questions in Parliament. It's hard to spot, but on one particular day, every time Peter Dutton got up to answer a question, he carried with him two large folders. One said Tony Burke, and the other said Chris Bowen, both former immigration ministers under Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. There is a lot more I'm happy to say about if you want to ask the next question, because regrettably I'm out of time now, but hopefully your next one will be better than the last. What he's trying to get at is that he can spill a lot of secrets as well if Labor keeps asking questions. Only there were two problems with this stunt. First, Chris Bowen called him on his bluff and asked for the folders to be tabled or made public to Parliament, which Peter Dutton refused to do. The member for McMahon on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister appeared to be quoting from documents in two folders. Can I ask him to table both folders? Yeah. <laughs> is the Minister the minister has is the minister have confidential material with him? Second, someone then put in a freedom of information request to the Department of Home Affairs. The request asked for the contents of the two folders. The response from the department was that it did not provide any such information to Peter Dutton. Probably folders full of blank pages. In September 2018, Greg Philipson appeared on ABC's 7.30 report. He had been a lawyer at the Immigration Department for almost 40 years and had just started a contract role at another government department. But the day after the program aired, he was told his contract would not be extended. He had appeared for less than 60 seconds and said that it was unusual for the minister to intervene in a case like this. It was clear that denying, minimizing and attempting to silence criticism wasn't working. So the last phase began. The government's diversion is this guy, 
former Australian Border Force Commissioner Roman Quadvelig. The former commissioner provided written submissions to the Senate inquiry into the au pair matter. Peter Dutton made sure to claim that this evidence was fabricated. The attacks on the former commissioner were quick and came from both Peter Dutton and the coalition. This smear is coming from the former Australian Border Force Commissioner, a man who was, as Commissioner, sacked from his position. He is discredited and disgraced, Mr Speaker. In their section of the Senate Inquiry Report, called the Coalition Senators Dissenting Report, the Liberals and Nationals also had basically the exact same talking points. They said that the disgraced former Commissioner was severely lacking in credibility and that the evidence may have been fabricated in an effort to avenge his termination from his former role. So much attention diverted to someone who didn't even appear in person to give evidence. His submission made up only a small portion of evidence, but you wouldn't get that impression from the coalition. I agree that the former commissioner is probably not the best witness. He was sacked from his role after helping his girlfriend get a job at the Australian Border Force, and an investigation by the Law Enforcement Integrity Commission made findings of corrupt conduct against him. And that's why I haven't gone through his submission or his allegations against Peter Dutton. I didn't need to. Remove his evidence completely and everything I have covered remains unchanged. Even the Senate inquiry wasn't able to give much weight to the evidence, given there was more questions than answers that were raised. But for Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party, this was an ideal diversion. Make it all about an apparent vendetta to distract from everything else. So what ended up happening out of all of this? The Senate inquiry concluded in its report that Peter Dutton's actions in these au pair cases had potentially damaged the integrity of Australia's immigration system. More importantly, it found that Peter Dutton had misled Parliament. That's probably the biggest takeaway out of all of this. The ministerial standards, released by Scott Morrison himself, says that ministers are expected to be honest and ensure they do not mislead the public or the Parliament. But that is exactly what was concluded to have happened. But nothing came of it. Scott Morrison declared his support for Peter Dutton and the coalition just moved on. I mean, just look at the recommendations that the coalition senators made in their dissenting Senate inquiry report, which by the way, they labelled as a farcical and shambolic witch hunt. The coalition senators recommend that Peter Dutton be commended for his prudent and diligent work as a minister. And they recommend that Peter Dutton ignore the majority report's findings. Ministerial standards need to mean something. Otherwise, this document is pointless. Anyone can get up in Parliament and say whatever they want, true or not. Considering all the denial, diversion and intimidation that we've seen over something apparently so routine, just imagine the things we don't know about the bigger issues. It's one rule for them and another rule for us. If you made it to the end, then thank you. These videos take ages to make and right now I'm a one man show. If you'd like to help support this channel grow, consider checking out my new Patreon page. Links are in the description below.